We're talking about the rock granite today. And I couldn't think of a better place to do so than with a bird's eye view of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Granite is an igneous rock. Igneous rocks can be classified in two broad categories. One being the extrusive or volcanic rocks, and the other being the intrusive or plutonic rocks. Now, intrusive rocks are formed by the cooling of magma at some depth in the earth, and this process allows time for crystal formation. So, we get relatively larger crystals. We refer to this coarse grain texture as phaneritic, and when we have a somewhat finer grain with large phenocrease or large crystals in it, we call that porphyritic. And if it's really coarse grained, we call that pegmatic. And we'll talk about pegmatites in a bit. Typical granite is comprised of a large amount of silica, as well as sodium and potassium. We know these elements from the minerals quartz and feldspar, which make up about 70% or more of the common granite. On the contrary, granites are relatively low in calcium and ferromagnesian minerals, that is, iron and magnesium, which make up about 30% or less of the typical granite. Granites are considered leucocratic in color, but the actual color of any given granite depends on the relative abundance and types of feldspars and the proportion of lighter to darker minerals. So, a granite with whites, grays, dark gray colorations is dominated by plagioclase feldspars or has a lot of those ferromagnesian minerals in it, like you see in this one here. And here's a chunk of granite that you see is more of a pinkish reddish tone. And we can infer that that is dominated by orthoclase feldspars and possibly varying amounts of hematite flakes. So mineralogically speaking, we find a lot of this mineral in a typical granite, and this is a chunk of quartz. We also find a good deal of feldspar in most granites. This is a crystal of feldspar. Now, we can find more or less of the potash feldspars, which is what this one is. So we find orthoclase or microclean feldspars, or we can find a granite with plagioclase feldspars, so anything on the scale of albite to oligoclase, depending on the amount of sodium and calcium present, such as what we see in this granite chunk here. The typical granite also has varying amounts of micas, such as muscovite, the lighter mica, and biotite, a darker mica, which is what you see in this granite. Those dark spots are biotite minerals. Other dark minerals present in granites include hornblende and sometimes, to a lesser amount, pyroxene. And other minerals that are associated with granites include apatite, garnet, hematite, magnetite, ilmenite, pyrite, rutile, titanite, and zircons. Those interesting looking hillsides that you see behind me are actually huge hills of eroding granite. And they're eroding in a style known as block jointing, which means huge blocks of granite are jointing and breaking off. These chunks would be taller than me, massive boulders. The granites then break down into these larger chunks of minerals until they break down to sand-sized particles that get carried away for hundreds of miles. The Appalachian Mountains of Eastern America used to be huge towering mountains, but their rocks, like granites, eroded down and built up the northern portion of Florida beaches. Granite can also erode in some other interesting styles. In the high mountains, the granites can erode into these interesting spires and crags and castle-like looking formations. Also, when glaciation has impacted the landscape, such as we see heavily in the Sierra Nevadas, we get a process known as exfoliation as well, where the granite and the rocks break off, the exterior of them breaks off in huge sheets, causing these smooth dome-looking masses of granite material. A granite is considered to have high crushing strength, a high resistance to weathering, and it takes a nice high polish. Because of that, it is used heavily for architecture and ornamental applications. Now, the potash-rich feldspars are also used to powder down to fertilizer. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of variety when it comes to granites. 
There's differences in the coloration and mineralogy and the physical components. As such, there's actually a lot of different names for these various rocks. There's cyanite, which refers to a quartz poor, lighter variety, and then there's monzonites and granite diorites, which are a little bit more darker and peppery looking than this. And there's also pegmatite, which has those really coarse grained, uh, sometimes uneven granular looks to it. And it's a source. It's a source of great large crystals like this one that you see here. Now, if you want to learn more about pegmatites, I'll be talking more about these in upcoming videos. So if you want to understand what a pegmatite is, or if you're into rock hounding and you want to know where to find great crystals, check out that upcoming video on pegmatites. In fact, the Sierra Nevada batholith is actually a complex combination of granites, granite diorites, diorites, and monzonite bodies. If it's your first time hearing the term batholith, just think of it as a pluton. Okay, that might not help. Um, think of it as an intrusion. Okay, remember at the beginning I talked about how igneous rocks like granite form, about the hot molten rock that is magma, cooling and crystallizing, hardening, and becoming these masses of rock? Well, that's how the Sierra Nevada is formed, and we call that a batholith. And over time, erosion has exposed it. So there you have it, granite, brought to you today courtesy of the lovely Sierra Nevada mountains and the adjacent White Mountains. We'll be talking more here about granites, those pegmatites, all types of igneous rocks, all types of rocks, and all things geo. So join me on the next adventure here at Let's Go Geo. I'll see you there. <laughs>